good afternoon, ladies and gents, and uh, thank you very much for sticking around uh, for these uh, these final two sessions. Um, so this panel is on the evolution of trade surveillance, uh, which is, uh, I think, actually quite a fascinating topic, and I'm looking forward to uh, to, to hearing uh, what the members of the panel, um, uh, the illustrious panel, uh, between them have many years of experience uh, in this, this sector, uh, have to say on the topic. Um, it's a quick introduction to me, for those of you who don't know me, Mike O'Hara, I'm a partner with the Realisation Group, we're a marketing strategy consultancy that focuses on the financial market sector. Um, and uh, uh, I do a lot of these, these, these kind of you know, panel sessions and uh, round tables and so on. And you know, I'm always quite keen to get interaction uh, with these discussions. Um, it, the, we've got a, a smaller group now than we had at the start of the day, so uh, please do feel free to you know, kind of uh, interject, to, to come up with questions and comments and so on as we're going through the, uh, as we're going through the session. Uh, rather than kind of leave all the questions to the end. If you do have a question or if you have a comment that you want to make as we're going through, please do try and you know, kind of raise my attention and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, I believe the Slido system will be in operation. Um, I actually prefer if people kind of ask questions themselves on the panel, um, but, uh, but do feel free to use the Slido app uh, as well and we'll see what questions come up from that. So, um, just a couple of uh, points before we launch into this. Um, as has been the case throughout the day, we're operating under the Chatham House rule, uh, which means please don't quote anybody um, without uh, checking anything with them first. Uh, feel free to write you know, anything that you like about what's discussed, but please don't attribute anything uh, as so without checking with people. Um, I'd like to point out that the panelists' views are their own. Um, they're, they're not here um, kind of reflecting kind of corporate policy of the firms that they're, they're working for. They're expressing their own opinions. Um, and um, yeah, so without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to hand over to the panelists just to give a brief introduction to, uh, to who they are and uh, why they're here. So uh, I'll start with you, Justin. Okay. Hi, I'm Justin Nathan. I am the Chief Technical Officer for Surveillance at Credit Suisse. up to date as the technology officer with technology and what's happening in the industry and I'm thinking cast my mind back to when I first started out um, it was just unimaginable how much technology is now crept into the industry. Thank you. Hello. Hi there, I'm Helen Lucas, I'm here from Callis Act Morris, I'm the uh, near head of the uh, compliance solutions. Uh, we actually have a booth here today, we haven't seen us yet, please come by but still around after this. Uh, but we're here promoting what we do in the FinCrime industry. Uh, Andy Maven from Telstra. Um, for those of you who haven't seen our kangaroos or koalas, uh, we have a, a, a good stand out there. We tend to go to exhibitions like this and give them all away. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I help Telstra uh, take our financial portfolio and our digital portfolio to the market. Okay. Uh, I'm Norton, as you West Communication Specialist. I've been working over the last 13 years, been on the vendor side, on the bank side, and now I'm working on the service integration company. Um, Great. Keen well, to, to start talking. Great. Well, thanks, thanks uh, uh, each of you. Um, so maybe if we can start by just looking at, you know, given that the topic of the panel is the evolution of trade surveillance, uh, if we can start by looking a little bit at the drivers behind the adoption of trade surveillance systems, which kind of sounds like a bit of a no-brainer question, obviously it's regulation, uh, but given the fact that uh, market abuse regulation has now been in place for a little while and MIFID 2 uh, went live at the start of this year, um, we are in a kind of changing regulatory environment. So I'd like to, to ask, and I'll start with you on this one, if I may, Justin, in terms of, you know, what, what has changed since the introduction of those regulations and you know, how are you seeing that impact what firms are having to do? Yeah, I mean, going back to like, the drivers of those changes would be the un unholy trinity of um, regulation, fines, and the senior management regime. All those are coming together to really focus the attention on surveillance and to um, make sure that the companies start to take this seriously. I mean, for a long, long time, it was just something that uh, was done on the side wasn't done with much integrity at all, but that changed. I mean, unless you're an exchange, of course, and good surveillance was good for your business, because if your markets weren't clean, then people wouldn't come to trade in your markets, and that affected your 
profit to the exchanges. I mean, I've worked for a couple as well. The exchanges generally have done surveillance very well. But part of the reason for that is, other than it's good for business, is that um, the exchanges have got a very finite market. They've got, like, say for example, if you're on the London Stock Exchange, you're only interested in conducting surveillance in the Stock Exchange. So coming on to what's changed, the regulations have just brought so much scope and increased the, uh, the depth of um, the asset classes, everything relating to them, the uh, behaviour indicators, which are really helpful actually in one way, but uh, now you've got to go through and show the evidence internally, externally, how that you've got everything covered. And being able to have everything covered all the time is one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest things that cause the change. I mean, there's a couple of things that haven't changed too much either. I mean, the, the, the data is still dirty. Um, the decision making is still uh, relatively poor sometimes, and uh, that's not going to go away anytime soon. Hello. Um, uh, just to imagine this holy trinity there of, of, of regulation, and fines, and the senior manager's regime. Um, is, is, is that what you see as well in terms of the, the three main drivers? And, uh, and, and can everything be covered all of the time? Yeah, so, so absolutely, um, following on from what Justin said, it, for me, in terms of the drivers, yes, they are key components of it, but they're not necessarily the be all and end all. I think now, um, one of the key things now is to find the right system for your business. It's not just necessarily a tick box exercise to find a surveillance system because it's, it's cheap or it fits uh, because you need one right now. It's more about understanding the actual underlying logistics around what it is that you're actually trying to survey. Um, in the compliance industry, it's very complex. So it, most things now need to go down to quite a granular detail. And it's not just the technology anymore, it's all about the right skills and resources that you have um, underpinning that. So that's making sure from a business point of view, you have the right resources in place to be able to understand what is actually going on in your business. Thanks. Um, Andy, let's bring you in here. So um, what, uh, in terms of Helen said there, that it's, it's not just a tick box exercise. <laughs> Uh, would you agree with that, or would, it, would, uh, would you say that you know, you've seen some firms uh, who have been treating this as a tick box exercise? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was on a call yesterday, and the guy said, actually, what I want to do is tick box. You know, I don't mind if my data's in different places. I don't mind if I'm a little bit back. I just want to tick the box to move on. And, and I think, you know, pretty nifty, we saw a lot of that. We saw, uh, especially the bit that we get involved in quite a lot uh, around the, um, the voice communication side. We saw a lot of people say, actually, you know, it's, it's about all sorts of other things. I can think about that later. And I think a lot of people have been leaving it, thinking about it later. I mean, I was rather surprised also, though, um, when our keynote uh, speaker this morning talked about Boston Group's stats saying, you know, 40% of the driver is efficiency. Because I'd love to drum, hit a drum talking about efficiency rather than talking about fines. Because, you know, it's a very competitive world with low volumes and low volatility. We need to have more efficiency in the market. But I still see people ticking boxes and not really getting to grips. Talk about dirty data, a lot of it out there. And what I'd rather talk about is actually kind of getting more insight to the data. Yeah. I don't think we're sitting there. Right. And uh, Nuno, just, just bringing you in on this, this, this question as well. I mean, um, and again, I don't know the particular aspects of, of what the other panelists have, have said on this, but I was interested again in something that Helen uh, said about, you know, it's not just the tech. Uh, that we're looking at here, yeah. it's, the, it's the skills, it's the people, it's the processes. Yes, not at all. So, just going back a bit, uh, so historically, for me, the main driver for people to start looking into surveillance was MARP. That was the regulation that actually brings surveillance into the table, and where start, people start looking into more detail into it, what it is, what we need to do with it. Um, I would like to have a, a bit more uh, positive view on it. I've seen a change. Um, I think, yes, initially it started as a tick box exercise, but I think the business now are more and more real realizing the benefit of having a surveillance platform. It doesn't come cheap to the business, so you need to take the most out of it. Um, and, and the challenge is around bringing all your surveillance together because when you're looking at threat surveillance you're not only looking 
get the structure data that you get from your trade surveillance systems. You're talking now about voice and communications and different channels and buckets of data a bit everywhere. How you bring all of that together? How you break the silos? And how you stop looking into surveillance as a tick box exercise and actually treat it as data that will um, make a competitive advantage for you and your company. And I see more and more that the banks, some of them had to go and the, the big tier ones had to invest a lot of money to, to get their systems up and running. And now they are looking into them and say, oh, actually you can do something else with this. Uh, we can actually turn it into a benefit for us. Um, and you see that that is involving. We see a lot of people during this last year, we've been here last year, talking about how you generate alerts, how many people you need to have somewhere offshore to treat those alerts, how many false positives you have, but now you're talking about bringing all of that together to one place, yeah. breaking the silos, getting the organization to work, um, to work across the organization. So I think there's much more to come. Mm -hmm. um, it will definitely evolve quickly. And then there's other thing. I, while I think NIFI didn't have a huge impact on surveillance, it might have augmented the scope because there's more people now in scope. But in terms of um, per se technology changes in the surveillance platforms, it, it actually didn't make much of a change. I think conduct is getting on the agenda this year. We've seen a lot of some senior management finds this year, and I think that will carry on moving forward. And I think looking to trade surveillance just for market is not enough, and the conduct agenda needs to come yeah. um, live as well. And I think we'll see that through the, throughout the year. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you hit the sweet spot there. Uh, when you talk about turning the data on back on itself, and then the business uh, see value and make business decisions off of it, they're the ones who are paying the money. So if they're paying the money and they're getting benefit back out of it, and you can go on field surveillance at the same time, and the data can also be used for a purpose, then, then people start to get interested. And once the money makers are interested in what you're doing, and they see value, like real value coming out of it, so that they don't start to think, you know what, we need to start defending ourselves. And, yeah. Yeah, let's screw the second line, let's get the first line going. <laughs> because the senior management ratio, we need to actually protect ourselves because there's just too many false positives mm. coming out of it all. Um, but one, if that sweet spot is struck, and it can't always be struck, but there are ways that um, I've seen it done, and done well, and done it myself, uh, then it's very powerful. Yeah, and I think we could, we could probably have a whole other panel on you know, how to gain business value from, from some of the, you know, this, this data that's being collected for uh, uh, surveillance purposes. But uh, um, let, you know, if, if we try, try and get it back on, on the, the area of surveillance for the moment, because I'd love to spend a lot of time talking about that. But uh, um, I, I think we, we, if we focus on the surveillance side of things, one of the points that you brought up there, Nuno, was, was that um, you know, the, the challenges around bringing all of this data together from multiple silos, uh, different business units, different asset classes, and so on. Um, Andy, um, can I ask your thoughts on that in terms of, if we look at the challenges of, of actually being able to track and monitor uh, and capture all of these different um, channels of, of information, you know, you've got instant messaging, you've got voice, you've got your electronic uh, trading and various e-coms. Um, how, how can firms go about addressing you know, such a huge challenge? Uh, yeah, I think one of the first things you need to do is understand the challenge. Now, if any of you have got kind of teenage kids in the room will know the challenge of actually how do you communicate with kids. What are they communicating you on? I mean, you know, it might be WhatsApp, it might be Snap, it might be Instagram Messenger, it might be Facebook Messenger, or probably not if they're teenagers. So everyone has their own way of communicating. And I think the, the challenge we're finding, especially when you look at firms dealing with their customers, is that you want frictionless communication. Because if you don't have frictionless communication, your customer will get somewhere else. That frictionless communication isn't often your choice. People communicate with you in the way they wish to, and they're the way that they want to. And as a firm, then how do you capture all of that? How do you even know you're doing it? Because people communicate in different ways, and if you make something too hard to use, they find a different way. It's just like you know, the way the water finds a path down the hill. And 
certainly we spend a lot of time helping the firm say, okay, how do we make sure we're putting um, tech in place that helps you capture many forms of different electronic communication, voice-based communication, so you can start um, covering those gateways out to the world so that you can actually say, we are capturing. I, I think the next thing to do is then say, well, actually, how do you, how do you make sure it isn't in a silo? Because you need to have you know, that proverbial data lake that we heard so much about a couple of years ago, but not swamp. So actually, how do you do that for my visibility? I think there are tools. I think um, as fast as you put tools in place, we have different tech that's coming up that provide an easy way. Yeah. And I think um, you know a lot of people's stories say voice is dead, but you know, everyone talks in that. So yeah. I think there's different ways of doing it. Helen, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that as well as a technologist. You know how um, the, one might think that it's kind of prohibitively prohibitively expensive to, to do all that, given the fact that you've got all of these different channels and so on. Um, is it, uh, is it how, how possible is it to, to, to kind of capture everything, monitor everything, surveil everything? I think one of the key things here is, is that everybody has uh, a different flavours of what they like to use in terms of their communication uh, and also in terms of how they collect their data. Um, one of the, I think one of the, the most challenging aspects here is to try and bring all of that data together. Sometimes you don't necessarily need to move it from where it actually lies. It's more about channeling it from this, from this existence. So if there are legacy systems that are in place that actually work perfectly fine, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to move them. It means that you just need to find that appropriate system that gathers and uh, transports that data into an analytic platform that you can use it to its best availability. And I guess one of the, the, the most challenging of uh, communications uh, methods to, to capture and analyze and, and surveil and do stuff with is voice. Right? Um, so um, again, be interested to get the panel's thoughts on you know what are some of the best practices, given the fact there's a lot of legacy technologies out there for, that are being used um, for, for traders uh, and so on to communicate via voice. Um, again, how do you get around it? So, dealing with some of those latency technologies and actually doing something meaningful with voice. Um, Justin and Nuno, I'd like to get both of you on this one. Uh, Nuno, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think the key here is surveillance com comes always after capturing. Mm -hmm. So by nature, that voice will be very transactional already between two silos. But when you're capturing, when you're surveilling. So I think it's easy, essential. And this is something I've been saying for a while. And that is a challenge to the vendors, um, is that we need more and more uh, open systems with open architectures. Mm. Like you say, you go into a bank, and have several platforms in that bank. You don't think you can go there. And because you need a surveillance system, you'll change your legacy. There's no money for it. There's no budget for it. So the vendors need to understand that they need to provide um, the banks the option to choose the best of breed. If that's, that's a possibility, then that allows other players in the market to come, come in and, and understand what, the bank, what are the, that particular bank needs and how you can integrate these different systems that they have, right? So I think that's one challenge we're seeing more and more. There's um, a lot of software uh, houses out there that are not doing that, and we we seen um, the other the other challenge with voice communications is is extremely unstructured. Mm. So probably some people will think that the phonetics it's the best way to do. Others will look into speech to text. Um, I think we should be quite open to what we are doing because. Phonetics will have its own advantage, speech to text will have its own advantages. It will be much better if you can use the both of them to enhance each other. Yeah. Right? So, and I think that, that leads into the, the discussion as well. How you reduce false positives? You do that by adding more technology, but not talking about a huge product that you go and install and you like an entire team and months of yeah. is having small modules that you can integrate with each other 
and that in the end can provide to you what you're looking for because everybody will be different. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the, the topic of false positives actually because I think that's, that's a, yeah, a really important uh, point to, uh, to drill down on in a bit more depth. But just before we get there, um, just in thoughts from you on, on, on the, the, the challenges associated with surveilling voice and how you get around to those challenges. There, there are two main competing forces in the world, one of them being chaos, the other one being order. <laughs> <laughs> Quote of the day. <laughs> voice as it stands uh, in the scheme of things, although there, there is a lot more chaos, there is chaos elsewhere too, represents absolute chaos. And trying to harness that has been very interesting, especially watching it from the sidelines and getting um, vendors coming in and hearing stories about so successes that in, in the markets or particular banks have done, and they feel very proud of it. They feel very proud. So brought chaos. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, maybe for you said that, bringing bring order, order up there. to the chaos of voice communication. Some of them might bring, be bringing chaos out of order. Absolutely. And how have they done that? <laughs> they, they've transcribed it to text. It's fantastic. I mean, I, you have to really give it to them if they've then managed to uh, transcribe the voice to text to begin with, because that's an achievement. Mm -hmm. But is it the objective? The objective is to then conduct surveillance on it and. Uh, so there are accents um, in the audience now where voice can't pick it up, and even if it did pick it up, then your idea is to then represent it to those same systems that are notorious for churning out false positives yeah. in many, many alerts, and you've brought order to the chaos and the voice through text to um, speech to text. Only to then reintroduce it to the chaos of the surveillance system. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? You are likely to get many, many, many more false positives through the lexicons that you're using as a result, and thereby be worse off than you were when you started. Yeah, yeah. Andy, so good. Uh, so, yeah, uh, love, love a good idea, man. I'm not going to disagree with that at all. I think the thing in this though is that if you want to capture voice. You've got to give an incentive for the guy to speak using lips, teeth, and tongue, like I tell my kids. You know, if you can get a trader who used to say, look, I'll pre for your trade ticket, if you can get a sales guy and say, look, I'll transcribe it and stick it into your sales force or your CRM for you, you've got to give someone an incentive. If the incentive is strong enough, they'll behave. If it's not, they won't, and they'll go back and do what they do. And, and this comes to, you know, the, the other point, you know, actually, how do you gain benefit from it? And if the benefit isn't given to the person who's speaking, you're not going to see the output in the next one. So incentives for traders to behave. That's <laughs> the other. That's the other. That's why people misbehave, right? Yeah. That's no incentives. Well, I think um. one other element that is the fact that you've got to be able to put what they're saying in context. I mean, you have to have the ability to be able to understand the financial jargon that's being used yeah. and understand what that actually means. And that's where the NLP comes into play. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a very good point. And there, there is a recent but it's, it's come a long way since then. A paper that was written um, in a US university by one of the professors, uh, who's done a study on, and they actually produced something, um, I'm not going to go into too much depth and keep on top of all that, but, uh, using masses of text, the more text, the better. So that's where your text, to, your voice to text comes in. So I'm not knocking the FP, mm -hmm. it's just what you do with it afterwards is the problem. There's words that aren't part of the lexicons and aren't part of NLP that um, give a massive insight into the cognitive psychology of a trader. And harnessing and going down that route could be very uh, interesting. Um, the, I mean, the emotions fine, thinking styles, uh, social concerns, that kind of thing. And there's certain very there's certain words and word count that give. It might be more interesting to find traders who are suspect and concern ourselves with what they say. I think Thatcher said she was more interested in what people were doing rather than saying, and mm. I feel the same way about mm. our voice communication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just before before we move on, uh, any questions, comments, thoughts from your speakers? <coughs> um, do we have a microphone? Yes, yeah. just give us one second. I find this discussion 
if I may say, just slightly unstructured from my all cognitive <laughs> reference background, because uh, from a retrofeeder's perspective, from a SMRFCA's perspective, they make this distinction rightly or wrongly between communications monitoring and trade surveillance. So when we talk about comms monitoring, when we talk about, about uh, speech uh, to text, for example, monitoring, XMI nice being one of the solutions and so on, and, and then there are aspects of that which could be preventative type of controls, depending on whether it's first line of defense control or, or not, and how quickly that control may be in place. With trade surveillance, by definition, would be after the event, and would be where MAR would come in, and uh, may pick up on uh, trading patterns or a, a number of things that were identified between, for example, FX spot fixing in terms of specified scenarios that FCA came up with and so on. The second point I wanted to make is that um, because this is a red tech conference, I would like to know a bit more about, uh, and I've picked up in the industry, people are working on some of the problems that you mentioned about the chaos theory where, yes, you're right that you know if people have different accents in different languages and so on, but there are solutions, particularly Google, as you know, Google AI solutions that are working on that, and as you know, many banks are using my voice and my password, so that's how much the technology has evolved. So for a bank to be able to get around it, at least for their own front office, they can, and some are actually making sure that they recognize the voice of each of the traders with the accents and everything. So yes, they won't pick up the other party, but they will pick up their own traders and will be able to identify exactly who said what, when, and what language, and so on. And this is where some of the solutions you talked about may come in and facilitate it better and make it easier for poor folks in the compliance team, for example, to do their job. Th thanks for the question and your observation. Before I, I, I ask the panel to respond to that, I'll hold my hands I'll take full responsibility for the fact that this is a very kind of unstructured session compared to some of the other sessions we've had today. That is intentional. Uh, we've had a lot of structured sessions today and I wanted to kind of mix it up a bit. So, yeah, apologies if uh, it's a little bit too unstructured. But then, trading is unstructured, right? You know? Uh, so, yeah, so please, if anybody would like to respond to the gentleman's comments. Well, let me just speak. Speaking more on the things you said, uh, I know people love, especially now cloud computing. Everyone gets excited, and, and we talk that Google has solutions for many years, and AWS, and they are not trained to be in the trading, the trading environment. If you want to read a Shakespeare and get Google to translate it for you, that's that's amazing. But that, that's not how traders speak. And, and, and that's not the, what you need to pick up on the trading floor. So you actually need a system that is able to understand the language you are talking. And the language on the trading floor is not English. <laughs> okay? It's, it's, it's tribal. It's, it's something that is tribal to a trading floor that only a certain amount of people understand. Mm -hmm. So we, we can look at Google and Amazon, it's all really good and, and they've been there for years, but you need something else, right? You, you're responding to regulations. You cannot afford to, 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 to not to think that you will rely on on something like Google and, and you'll be fine because you will not, right? So I'll, I pick that on the speech to text. The other thing I want to say, right, is I agree speech to text probably now everyone talks about it and it's something really important. But if we are just only doing speech to text, we are losing a lot of value from our voice that can help us, right? What about emotion? What about a lot of other things that your voice print gives you mm -hmm. that will not be able to pass into a speech to text? So speech to text will be a piece of the puzzle, but the puzzle is much bigger. So that's why I said, let's understand what we are talking about and let's realize that there's no silver bullet. There's no one solution. You need different modules to take the most yeah. of the type of communication you are, you are surviving. You've got to be savvy about it good as well. I think that, like I said, LIBOR, LIBOR really uh, helped capture the imagination because there's some really good uh, words in there for people to read on the paper on the, on the way home. But ultimately, uh, trade could have captured that long before all the trawling through the voice and the uh, text would have been found and made the headlines. The 
For example, the <coughs> trading rate versus submission rate. If there's a difference of X, then go back and look at the communications. And then there you have it. That would have got to those communications that you're trying to transcribe to text much faster than um, any efforts to transcribe anything to text. Yeah. I, I just want to say that from a trade surveillance point of view, it's definitely not after the event. It's very much looking at the intent as well as an execution. Um, and so you definitely need to bring the voice of the trade systems together to be able to identify exactly how that might manifest itself. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to maybe spend a few minutes uh, talking about <laughs> false positives now, because I think with any um, surveillance technology, you know, the purpose of, of a surveillance system is to identify uh, malicious or disruptive or, or nefarious activity. Um, and um, surveillance systems generate alerts based on you know, various parameters that you might have predefined. Um, but one of the problems that I think you know, anybody who's involved in surveillance faces um, uh, constantly is, is the, the issue of false positives. Um, what you obviously don't want to do is to kind of tune everything down so that you don't get any alerts at all. So how do you strike the balance between you know, picking up um, what is a true alert versus just being constantly alerted all the time? Where, 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 where do you start? Um, who'd like to, to take that one first? Helen? Okay. Um, and I'll be as quick as I can because I know we're running out of time. Um, so from my point of view, this is very much looking at, looking at the systems that do your surveillance and understanding exactly how they can be tuned for your business. So that's going back to saying what I was earlier. Um, but that's also looking at understanding the practices that you do within your business. So just taking an example, um, Mike mentioned about tuning everything right down so you get nothing. Just pre-warned, uh, there was a, a, an element in the marketplace where JPM um, experienced the downside of that. They actually got fined uh, for setting their thresholds too low and they were deemed unlikely to be uh, catching any non-compliance uh, that was going on in their business. So you've got to be working smarter. You've got to be looking at what you can actually achieve um, in a practical way that can be covered by your resources that you actually have uh, in your business. So I'll make it quick and I'll pass it on. What does he actually mean? <laughs> um, I mean, we've got to say, like, looking front row, got three people. I bet if I was asking each of you what a false positive was, you'd probably get four answers and four definitions of what it is because it means so many things to so many people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think the best the, the thing is, is like, um, from a from false positive was taken from different <coughs> industry, brought into ours to explain what was going on within it, but. Um, False positive away from there is basically anything that is within that is basically anything that isn't a true positive is a false positive. <laughs> <laughs> and even though the ones that argue against it, it's usually because it doesn't fit the agenda because otherwise they're running at a very scary rate of false positives. Scientifically, that's exactly what it is. So taking the um, story of the boy who cried wolf, when he cried wolf and no um, wolf was there and people got upset. That was a false positive. Yep. But later on, when he cried wolf and there was a wolf there, that was a true positive. So <laughs> the idea of that defining, first thing we'd be able to define false positives um, by defining what the true positive is, and then we can get on to defining what the false positives are. And once we've done that, then we can talk about what a false negative is and what a true negative is too. And you conclude that by working smarter with your uh, actual parameters around your settings. Andy, anything you've got to add on the... On the well, I look, I'm just let's throw data out there, Barry. I mean, two things here is that the bigger the data set you've got, the more chance you have to find a correlation. I, I would argue again that actually finding false positives in the bank has got to be a joyous thing, right? Because what you don't want to do is find someone who's not compliant. Very often. Um, I think, though, the other thing as well is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to narrow those down yourself so that you don't overwork your staff and you give them enough um, time in their day to do something meaningful. So it's the question of working through your analytics and actually you know, focusing on the things that, that are going to make a difference. Understanding yeah. the analytics and the logistics that are behind them. What is the false positives? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just, just leave one uh, here on the false positives is that I think that there are 
threat will always be there until we look at threat surveillance as a alert driven function. I think when there's an effective change from to a more behavioral aspect of the threat surveillance and the risk-based approach that will reduce significantly on this area. Until then, we can keep adding technology and we certainly get better at it, but they will not go away and that will still be a problem operationally to resolve. That's just my view. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, do, um, and I do have one more question, one more topic coming up, but do we have any more questions from the audience before, uh, before we do? Yes. Sorry, just wait for my mic. Just on time. All right, I'm Lovett from Data IT. First of all, I want to say how delighted I am to to hear your topic so much on specific text. I'm a specific tech fan. <laughs> 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 it's been it's been a massive addition of training course for for quite some time. Uh, so, um, so my question is: So I, I totally agree with what you say and with what you say now. Uh, about the, um, first of all, the order of the cut and chaos stuff, and about the, the, the modern approach and the value approach, etc., and what you find out. And so, my question is we, uh, what, what kind of maturity would you uh, assign to the current, um, uh, say, e com surveillance systems that, that are around? Would you say that they're more mature uh, than the, the voice com surveillance systems, or they're as Immature or I have you have flavors for everything, really. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so let me get to that one, right? So, so I think um, where you have structured data coming back to the gentleman here, and you've got written or electronic communication, um, I think it's a wonderful tech in the market. I think the challenge you've got is a lot of our customers uh, are using very old and antiquated voice telephony systems to capture data, capturing data in an important way, and to absolutely just his point, you get rubbish. Because you've got rubbish, you're capturing rubbish, you're trying to transcribe rubbish or do flat search on rubbish. And so actually there's been a lot of work in that area, but until people's capture mechanisms for voice improve and they're not doing that very quickly, I don't think we're going to see the breakthrough that you're looking for in um, in the chaos of some of this. Yeah, I'll just be and uh, next it's actually just use trade as a springboard into comms. It's right. effective. And as long as your trade's effective, I mean, of course, otherwise you're looking for chaos to get into even more. But uh, that aside, having a point in time, um, and also people are actually speaking this, aren't they? The trade becomes more um, electronic and uh, high frequency. So how much effort you want to put into it is, is, is another matter. But yeah, just generally, using what you see in trade in markets, Markets will have the answer. Use what you see in the markets to springboard into the event and surround yourself with communication. Okay, um, I'd love to continue the discussion, but um, uh, unfortunately, having to, to draw it to, to a close. Um, so um, I'd like to thank the panel, Justin, Helen, Andy, and Nuno, for a, a very enjoyable, unstructured.